I'm going to speak to you today about our management challenges when we treat psoriasis in women. These are my disclosures. Just to share with you an interesting uh, information that the oldest known psoriasis patient ever was Queen Hatshepsut, which is an ancient Egyptian queen, and all the ancient Egyptians regard the psoriasis as God's curse. Psoriasis affects the quality of life. And we all know that it has a severe impact on the quality of life of the patients. This depends on the severity of the disease, when did the disease start, the age of onset of the disease, gender, whether male or female, and the location of the disease itself. We are now going to speak about women in particular, because this is what, what we're interested in. Now, we all know psoriasis has a bimodal age of onset. The first peak occurs between the age of 15 to 39 years. The second peak occurs between 50 to 59 years of age. So that means that women of reproductive age with psoriasis represent a significant patient group. So why is this? It's important because usually half the pregnancies are unplanned. And the implications of the therapeutic options must be considered for all women who are sexually active with psoriasis, irrespective with their intentions to start a family or not. Because usually patients come pregnant accidentally, so we must put... This is a paper that was published in uh, the International Journal of Women's Dermatology by Alice Gottlieb, talking about the clinical consideration for the management of psoriasis. What is the burden of psoriasis in women? They found that psoriasis hits women more than men. It gives lower happiness, more stress, more loneliness, more stigmatization, and women report a higher dermatology life quality index score than men, even if they have better PASI. And of course, genital psoriasis has severe impact on the sexual life of women and causes more sexual dysfunction than men. Does actually psoriasis affect fertility? Well, it doesn't. But we need to know that 22% lower likelihood of pregnancy occurred among women with psoriasis compared with the overall population. Why is this happening? There are complex reasons. First of all, women with psoriasis voluntarily do not want to have children. They are worried about the disease activity if they become pregnant, worried about the different medications that they affect on their pregnancy. And of course, there is no intimacy because a psoriasis patient does not want to have sexual relationship because she is very embarrassed. And sometimes there is physical inability to have intercourse if the patient has severe psoriatic arthritis. What happens to psoriasis in pregnancy? In 21% of patients, they are stabilized, 55% improve, 24% become worse, and definitely half of the patient get a postpartum flare. Why does pregnancy improve psoriasis? Because during pregnancy, the maternal immune response shifts from Th1 to Th2, and both Th17 and Th1 become downregulated during pregnancy so the patient disease status can ameliorate during pregnancy, and this sometimes also increased estrogen level uh, correlates directly with psoriasis improvement during pregnancy, and this usually this improvement tends to appear the fourth week of pregnancy. But of course, as we all know, that psoriasis has a risk of comorbidities, as it increases the risk of outcome. This is a paper about the reproductive patterns and maternal and pregnancy outcomes in women. And they found that women with severe psoriasis had a increased risk of pregnancy, hypertension, premature rupture of membranes, and giving birth to large for gestational age infants. And based on few events, there was an association between psoriasis and cleft palate in children. 
This was adapted from um, Alice Gottlieb's paper in the International Journal of Women's Dermatological Society, and she just documented low birth weight and uh, preeclampsia and prematurity in some patients with psoriasis. What about pustular psoriasis? Pustular psoriasis may be induced by hormonal changes. It's a completely different story, and usually it presents with fever, malaise, diarrhea, elevated marker of systemic inflammation. The patient is very sick, and in these cases, we have, there, is, there has to be a collaboration between dermatologists, obstetrician, and neonatologists, especially if the patient has severe pustular psoriasis and she's pregnant. Now let's talk about how are we going to manage psoriasis in women with a childbearing age. First of all, we have to do preconception counseling and advise the patients about contraception. Assess the patient's desire to become pregnant. Talk to her about the benefit and risk of different therapies. So I need really a gynecologist for reproductive health counsel. And if she becomes pregnant, she needs to be followed up very carefully during her pregnancy and during the postpartum period. What are the treatments allowed in pregnancy? We are allowed to give topical steroids, topical vitamin D with caution, topical calcium urine inhibitors, and of course, moisturizers. We prefer not to use antraline or calcipotrine, tar or salicylic acid. It's not recommended, and of course, it's absolutely contraindicated to use any topical retinoids because they are in the category X with their um, liability to cause teratogenic effects on the fetus. So we do not. So we are allowed to use only topical steroids, moisturizers. We can use uh, topical calcium urine inhibitors. And sometimes we can use topical vitamin D if we have to, but they're very short. We are allowed to use phototherapy, but only uh, UVB. PUVA is not allowed in pregnancy. Systemic therapies, those are our only two drugs allowed to be given during pregnancy, cyclosporin or tumor necrosis factor alpha inhibitors. As you all know, methotrexate is teratogenic. It, it even, we do not even give it to the partner of the patient who wants to become pregnant, so methotrexate is contraindicated and should be stopped three months prior to any planned pregnancy. Retinoic acid causes embryopathy and spontaneous abortion, and it's absolutely contraindicated. And acetretin also is be required to be stopped two years before the patient plans to become pregnant. So I'd rather not give acetretin in any girl or any female in the childbearing period or is planning to get married. What about biologics? Most of them pass minimally through the placental barrier in the first two trimesters until the active transport starts at the third trimester. It occurs due to the development of the fetal FC receptor itself. Patients who continue treating during the third trimester should only remember that they should not give live vaccinations to the newborn, especially the MMR, which is the measles. anti dtf should be considered over the interleukin 12, 23, or 17 because of the availability of long-term safety data and the use of sertolizumab can be used throughout all. This is to show the fetal exposure to different biologic and a lot of papers have come out talking about the safety and the anti-TNF agents. So, but here, this paper from Denmark, they had a big group and they thought that some of the drugs were associated with increased risk of preterm birth, C-section, and small for gestational age. However, these findings may indicate an associated, not related to the TNF alpha itself, but it might be related to the psoriasis itself. There is a lot of research that needs to be done to clarify this area more. This is the safest TNF um, during pregnancy. This is what we call the sertolizumab pigol. It's a useful option because it um, provides an important treatment option for women in the childbearing age because it has a unique structure that does not continue the FC, uh, contain the FC portion, 
which distinguishes cetuzumab from the other anti-TNFs where it has no late active placental transfer. Because the IgG is the only antibody that can cross the placental barrier between the mother and the fetus by a specific FC portion. So without this portion, um, the drug is expected to cause lower fetal exposure compared with other anti-TNFs. Therefore, it is the only biologic that is labeled for use in pregnancy and lactation by the FCA, sertolizumab pegol or the Simzia. So, practically speaking, the structure of the biologic and its likelihood of its passage across the placenta, when or if the biologic should be discontinued, benefit of controlling the disease flare versus the risk to the fetus. So these are practical points to think about if our patient Women with psoriasis should plan a pregnancy when they are in remission and off medication, or take the minimum effective dose of medication that have the best possible fetal safety profile. This is unrealistic, and we need a need for effective and safe treatment option during pregnancy in women with psoriasis. It started with the anti-TNF, but I think we need more and more options for the A patient cannot be managed successfully with topical therapies and phototherapy then I think we have to give systemic therapy, either cyclosporin or septorizumab as an anti-TNF drug, um, because this will, um, the, the, these findings regarding the septorizumab, they fulfill an unmet need of a systemic drug to use in crisis. Now, this is um, breaking news, really, because this is, has been out in February 2021, it shows the pregnancy outcomes in women with moderate to severe psoriasis from the SOLAR, which is the registry. And they, this is, I think, we need more data from our registry. So they thought, showed that 298 pregnancy occurred, um, um, the, and the outcomes among women with moderate to severe psoriasis remained consistent with other recorded data of the general population. So they, we need more and more to, like, and establish the relationship between uh, psoriasis and pregnancy. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.